make sure the audio is working. Um, how's everybody doing today? Um, so it looks like Twitch is actually working today. Um, this morning it was uh, it was down, which was kind of unfortunate. Um, anyway, so uh, so how's everybody? How are we doing today? Hopefully decent. Um, oh wow, we've got three whole people logged on. That's uh, yeah, great. Um, all right, well let's uh, let's get to it here in a minute. Um, hopefully the um, the assignment from yesterday uh, made sense. The basically just um, uh, it was sort of a uh, just sort of quick check basically to make sure that uh, the opcode table uh, to translate from English instructions to the opcodes. Uh, so hopefully that made sense. Uh, was not meant to be rocket science, basically. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's, um, what I'd like to kind of do today, so let me, um, let me actually go into the notes here. And we talked about, um, let's see, we talked about loops. Um, so, um, we, um, we wrote last time, let me just uh, pull it up here, this is our uh, sort of cheesy um, uh, multiplication program. I've got another sort of shorter example here uh, for um, doing uh, basically just a, a thing that counts up from 0 to 5. So, so this program is kind of like uh, our counter only part from our uh, example uh, here. Uh, then there's the spicier example, which is the Fibonacci's, and so I'll let you guys read through that, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it will make sense. Um, it's kind of nice because we've got um, uh, what's what's sort of fun about it is there's actually a place where um, I uh, I had to over uh, make the program self multiply or self multiplying. Sorry self-modifying, uh, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, so, so maybe have a look at that and, and, and think about it. Um, what I wanted to kind of talk about here is something I'm, I'm working on in the notes, um, which is a compiler-like cookbook. So um, what we did last time is we wrote uh, over here on the right, we wrote... Um, in Python, or we could have written in Java or C, or you know, really any high-level language, uh, we wrote their uh, code uh, in high-level language, or almost like English. And then what we did was we went through the process of translating this into our assembly. Uh, which is the load 1, E0, and so on. And then uh, after we had kind of mostly translated into assembly and had all of that set, then we had to figure out, okay, the memory addresses and also what each of the individual opcodes would be. The, the beauty of assembly is that for the most part, um, every, every uh, single assembly instruction uh, corresponds precisely to one uh, set of opcode stuff there. So an opcode is the first thing, and then there's three operands that follow it. So um, this is one reason that I, I made up the assembly for this language, is so that we could, we could go from this, which is still human readable to some extent, to, uh, straight to the opcodes and have sort of an intermediary. So the... Um, 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 yeah, um, private class, let's go. Yeah, we've got kind of a pathetic, uh, pathetic turnout this afternoon, all seven of you. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, uh, in practice, uh, on a real computer, you would, uh, 
uh, the process of taking a high-level program like this, the stuff I've highlighted, our Python code or C or Java or whatever, um, and turning that into assembly is handled by a program for you, and that's called a compiler. And then once you have sort of compiled code, which would be the assembly, then another program called the assembler um, is what turns it into the sequence of, you know, 11E0, 12E1, that sort of uh, stuff, the actual uh, binary. Um, so what I wanted to kind of do was to talk about um, a compiler-like cookbook, which is to say there is not a compiler for this, uh, for this processor because, well, for two reasons. This processor was made up, and... Um, so uh, it nobody's written any software for it, basically, or hardly any. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, there's no compiler because, well, I haven't gotten around to writing one, uh, or assembler for that matter. So we have to kind of do that all by hand. But what I wanted to do was kind of elaborate as to, all right, the major structures that we use in programming are... Um, well, so let's think about those. We had conditional expressions, so those would be uh, statements of the form if then or if then else, okay? Uh, and then we also had iterative expressions, so those were our loops, and there were sort of three major types, um, do while, while, and for, um, and uh, although they're, they're all relatively similar, so what I want to kind of do is uh, talk about how, in the abstract, you can take something that would look like one of these high-level structures and sort of broad strokes translate that into, um, into assembly. Now, it's not going to be a perfect, like, uh, cookie-cutter translation uh, because there's still a lot of stuff like which register are you using for things, etc., um, that um, are not uh, like that you'll still have to think about, but it'll at least give you kind of a, a broad stroke sort of uh, uh, guide to uh, to when you start to program this stuff. Um, okay, so let me save this as. Uh, as something, and what I'm going to do is basically write um, uh, a statement in Python, and then we'll talk about how to sort of correspondingly uh, come up with that statement in assembly. Um, okay, so let's start with, um, well, here, let me change the, um, um, the thing to assembly. Um, and uh, strictly speaking, I'm using x86 assembly uh, for the syntax highlighting and stuff. One of the other things on my bucket list is to write a Brookshire assembly uh, extension for, for Atom, which is the text editor I'm using. But, you know, um, only so many hours in the day. Um, Okay, so first off, let's write uh, what an if-then type statement would look like in Python. Okay, so um, in Python, we might have something like We might have something like this. Okay, so the um, our program, let's say it does some stuff, whatever that is, and then it comes along and it's got if a condition is true, okay, and then the condition uh, could be a whole bunch of things, right? It could be that a number is equal to another number, or that that a number is less than another number, or right, any logical condition. Okay, so um, 
maybe a, a good way to, to illustrate that is, if you'll indulge me for a moment, let me come over here to Scratch. Um, so, um, in Scratch, when we had conditionals, uh, those were under control, right? And it was this. So, in Scratch, right, it was if pointy thing, then. And the object inside the pointy dude had to be a logical uh, object, meaning that the, the thing inside the pointies was either ever tr always ever true or false. Okay, so those were things like touching a mouse pointer or a color, like you either are or are not touching a thing. Or in the math zone, you either are equal to or you aren't, or you're less than or you're not, right? Okay, so all of the pointy things were either, uh, for no matter what they were, were either a true thing or a false thing. Okay, so similarly, uh, in Python, or really any language, the conditionals here, uh, the condition has to be something that can either be true or false only. Okay, so it can't be a mathematical expression that evaluates to... Uh, you know, a number um, with one exception. Uh, has anybody seen case switches um, in uh, like uh, a high school class or something? No? Okay. Well, anyway, that's sort of a special construct, but we don't really have to worry about that. So, uh, Anyway, um, but basically all the conditions have to be true or false. That's it, okay? Um, so, uh, in order to compile this, right, then um, then uh, whatever happens first, the stuff, well, it's going to be an assembly of some sort, okay? So whatever it is, we'll just call that assembly for stuff. Okay, and then uh, when we're finished with the conditional, whether or not it happens, there's going to be assembly for whatever the more stuff is. Okay, and it's the stuff in between that uh, we really want to concentrate on. Okay, um, and because what we need to do is before we can check whether or not the condition is true or false, we need to compute the condition. Okay, so the first thing is compute the condition. Or let me just say it this way. Okay. So we need to compute whatever the condition is and store it in a register. Okay. Um, and then um, to do the condition, the, the if statement, so let's go back over here to the notes. Um, let me go back up to the opcode table. All right, so the... Uh, all of these uh, instructions that we're writing, the conditionals and the looping structures, they all work because of this instruction right here. Okay, So an instruction like this is what makes a computer actually a computer as opposed to just a glorified calculator. Okay, the ability to uh, change where in a memory it's going to be loading and executing instructions okay now um, on our particular machine there is only one jump command okay and it's the, the one that I've highlighted there on some machines there are multiple versions of the jump command um, we only have one okay and the only one that we have is to jump uh, whenever something is equal to register zero, okay? So, uh, in the case of a conditional like this, okay, then I would jump past 
do thing if I am not going to do the condition. Okay, so if uh, the condition is false, I want to jump past the do thing instruction, whatever those are. Okay, if the condition is true, I want to actually do the, uh, the instructions. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to then store... Um, or actually, let me say this. I need to store whatever the negation of the condition is in R0, okay? And the negation, um, yes, yeah, so it's, okay, it's it's not really a false result. So let me, let me think of it this way, um, or explain it this way. Um, register 0 is going to contain, well, like any register, just numbers, right? It's just containing a big sequence of binary things. And so... Um, uh, when uh, you evaluate a condition, uh, it has to evaluate to either true or false. But what I'm going to do, what we're going to think of is, rather than thinking of it as evaluating to the word true or false, just be that it evaluates to one of two values numerically. And we'll think of one of those as representing true and the other one as representing false. Okay? Um, and the reason that I'm going to put the opposite of the condition in register 0 is because, look back over on the opcode table, when do we jump? We jump if something is equal to something else. Okay, so um, if I put the conditions computation in um, the... Uh, store this in a register, let me call that, say, register R question mark. Well, no, that's, let me say Rx. Um, well, you know what, okay, let me, let me kind of, um, let me add some stuff in here to kind of, I, I'm not being very clear. Okay, so uh, the condition can either be true or false. Um, in binary, this means the condition um, evaluates to two different, well, precisely Okay, so uh, when you do the, con the the evaluating anything, right, so what, what do we mean when we say true or false? Well, um, the, so, so maybe, maybe an example of this would be, why don't we actually look at, um, and this will hopefully make clear what I was trying to get at here. Let's look at this example program that we wrote, uh, this was... Wednesday, no, Monday, okay, when we started talking about conditionals, okay, um, we were talking about how to detect, uh, how to determine whether or not a number was negative, okay, so how was it that we talked about a number being negative or positive um, in either two's complement or in floating point, so what, uh, what was the giveaway for whether or not a number was positive or negative? Okay, a one, but a one where? It's 
so the, the location of the one is what was really critical here. Yeah, the far left bit. So this is true both in floating point and in uh, integer storage, to complement. If the far left bit is a 1, then the number is negative, or maybe better put, it's not positive. And if the far left bit is a 0, then the number is, uh, sorry, I said that backwards. Okay, if the far left bit is a 1, the number is negative, period. If the far left bit is a 0, then the number is not negative. It's probably positive, but it could have been just flat out equal to zero. Okay, so um, how did we extract the far left bit from the number? In the case of our example program, what we did was we took um, we took the bit pattern 8-0, okay, uh, or sorry, uh, the hex pattern 8-0, that would be a 1 followed by 7 zeros, okay? And we anded it against our given number, okay? So when we and 8 zero with a number, then what came out? There were two possible values. We either got 8 zero or we got 0, 0, okay? Those are the only two uh, possibilities. Does that part make sense? One more time, sorry, my audio cut out. Okay, um, all right, so. How did we determine if a number was positive or negative? Okay, so let me let me come down here and just kind of sketch it out. Okay, so suppose we have a number um, in R2. Okay. Okay, so here's the question. Um, uh, we loaded 80 into register 1, and we've got some number loaded into register 2. We don't know what that number is. It, it could be anything. Okay, we then computed bitwise AND between register 1 and register 2, and we put the answer in register 3. Okay. What are the two possible values that could be in register 3 after we've done that? Okay, you might think that there are, who knows, right? But I, I claim that there are precisely two answers that we could have ended up with. No more, no less. Okay, so what are the two possible values? And then we can sort of talk about why those are the two possible values. Okay, yeah, it's zero zero or eight zero. Okay, so if uh, we anded a number against the bit pattern 8-0, then all the seven bit positions on the far right are going to stay zeros. Okay, they're going to, be, sorry, become zeros. Because if you and anything against zero, you get zero. Okay, so the only question here is what is the far left bit position? Uh, is it a 1? Or is it a zero? If it's a one, then that would mean that we would get the bit pattern 
uh, the hex a zero. And if it's a zero, we would get this. Okay, so uh, this is what I mean by a true false thing, really meaning that numerically, it's something that evaluates to precisely two values, okay? In this case, those two values were eight zero or zero zero, okay? It doesn't have to be eight zero and zero zero necessarily, it just was in uh, the particular example that we were looking at a second ago. Okay, so uh, back up to, um, to here, um, Let's, uh, let's say this, okay, so let's, um, um, let's say um, we have two bit patterns, okay, uh, and that would be our, con our condition can evaluate to. One of those bit patterns we've called true, or say represents true, the other one will say represents false, okay? So in our example down here, when we were talking about positives and negatives, uh, we had the two bit patterns, zero, zero, and eight, zero, okay? And I thought about uh, eight, zero as being the false one, and zero, zero, sorry, I said it backwards. Eight, zero as being the true one, and zero, zero as being the false one, okay? But you just have to make a choice as to which one you call that. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is first compute the value of the condition, okay? So you're going to store in a register, and I've called it Rx here, just meaning we don't know which register, that's up to you, um, the value of the condition. Okay, so that's going to either be the bit pattern that you're calling for the moment true, or the bit pattern that you're calling false. One of the two, we don't know. Store whatever you're calling false into register zero. Okay, and... Sorry, my audio cut out for a second. Um, so store whatever you're calling false into register zero. And then you're going to have the following command. Okay, jump rx mn. So what this is going to do, it's going to compare um, register x, whatever register you picked, to register zero, okay? And when do you execute, so let me come back up to the top here, let me highlight the Python. When do you execute do thing? Okay, so this is, uh, the question is, under what circumstances do you execute the line do thing? Yeah, if the condition is true. Okay, so the jump command is what would take you past do thing if the condition were false, okay? And that's why I loaded whatever we called false into register zero, because the jump command is going to take me past the inside of the conditional, right? So if I jump, then I won't do do thing. So that may seem a little bit backwards, but that's why I um, uh, did it. That's why I wrote it that way, okay? And so, um, okay, so here's sort of our, our cookbook, okay? Um, I want to do whatever the stuff that comes before the, con the if statement. Okay, that's fine. I need to compute my condition, whatever that means, and store the computed value to register x. Call whatever I, uh, whatever for this particular condition I'm saying I'm gonna call false, put that bit pattern in register zero. Okay, so here's sort of the thing, right? If 
let's say that the stuff in register X is true. Then the jump command here is going to say, is the true bit pattern equal to the false bit pattern? And it will say, no, no, it's not. I am not going to jump, and therefore I will do this thing here. Okay, and if that statement is true, yes, oops, sorry, um, yes, yes, that is true, I will jump, and I will jump past the condition and move on to the next thing. Okay, so like I said, that may feel a slightly backwards, um, but uh, that's the only real way to do that, and the reason that we have to kind of think backwards like that is let's go back to our opcode table and look at the opcode details and see why we had to think this way. Okay, it's because the jump command jumps when two things are equal, not when two things are different. Okay, this is the only jump command we have uh, is jumping on equal, not we don't have a command to jump on non-equal, okay? Uh, now, some processors, actually probably every processor, does have something like this where you can jump on equal, not equal, less than, a whole bunch of different uh, jump options. But this is literally the only one we've got, and that's why we had to kind of think, um, think sort of outside the box um, here. Okay. Uh, does that, any questions so far? Um, I know this is a little bit kind of high level um, because we're thinking very abstractly here. Um, Uh, so, with this program, does that make creating a condition where something is greater than or less than impossible? No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so, um, because, and let me come down here uh, to kind of explain why. Um, so, we figured out how to tell whether or not a number is negative or not, right? So we, we know how to tell if something is positive, or sorry, is negative or not negative, okay? Uh, okay, well, so if we want to do greater than or less than, here's how we do it. Let's say that the, a number A is greater than a number B. is the same as saying that A minus B is greater than zero. Okay, so if you want to tell whether or not something is greater or less than, what you really have to do is determine whether or not that difference is bigger or less than zero. Okay, so Teague, does that make sense? It's taking, like, we have to basically use a little bit of logic and knowledge of math to say, all right, a is bigger than B means that, um, and let's say, let's take greater than or equal, because that maybe is a good example. Okay, um, if you have a compound statement like greater than or equal to zero, um, then uh, you can always use uh, the logical or, right? So, a condition can be a complicated expression, okay? So maybe a good way to illustrate what I mean by that is let's actually go back to scratch, okay? And to say, like, the thing that's inside that con uh, the condition, right, could be the logical or of two other things, right? And so we had some pretty complicated things where, like, you did something like, uh, let's say that... Um, um, oh, I don't know. I'm just going to make something up. Um, well, actually, let me use and here. That's maybe a better, uh, better example. Oops. OK, 
Okay, so we could have made a con construct that looked sort of like this, that the value of my variable is either greater than 50 or less than 100. Um, or sorry, uh, it's the and of those things. So this would be true whenever my variable is between 50 and 100. Okay, so how would we translate that into assembly? Well, this is something we can translate. That is something we can translate. And we have an operation that does the and of two things. Okay, so um, how would we tell if a variable is bigger than 50? Well, we would say subtract 50 from the variable and see if you get a positive or a negative. Okay, um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so does that that make sense, Teague? That you can uh, you have to be able to translate things into what you have operations to do. Okay. Um, now, your condition can be really complicated. In our example with telling whether or not a number is um, positive or negative, the condition was relatively straightforward. But as you guys are seeing, right, when you're doing your scratch stuff, the condition that you put in there could be really complicated, and it could be built out of lots of smaller conditions using the logical operations of and, or, and not. Um, or XOR, okay, and uh, notice, by the way, actually, um, I didn't realize this until just now, uh, XOR is not built into Scratch, okay, uh, not by default. I mean, you can build it, right, because what was the definition of XOR? It was A or B, but not both, right, and we can build that out of AND, OR, and NOT. Uh, in our language, we have OR, AND, and XOR, we did not have a not, okay? So we got not by using XOR against a bit pattern of all ones, right? So that was the, the same trick we used to flip uh, flip bits when we did uh, two's complement was using XOR, okay? So um, it uh, we can get any logical statement that we want uh, by combining these three things. Um, in clever ways, uh, or in Scratch, you could get all the same stuff by combining those three logical operations. Uh, it You just have to have sort of a, a bare minimum couple of them, and uh, then you can build any logical statement you want. And if you want to know some more of the details about that, I would highly invite you guys to take um, uh, the... Uh, intro to symbolic logic course that's offered in the philosophy department uh, or math 108 uh, with us in math uh, both would uh, talk about logic quite a bit okay so um, now let's go back to our our cookbook okay and basically these think of what I've typed here is sort of scratch paper and, and I'm kind of trying to clean this up a little bit and uh, so that I can put it in here in my cookbook, okay? Um, all right, so then that was an example of sort of how to think about an if-then statement. An if-then-else statement is uh, a little bit more complicated because you have... Um, uh, two things. So let me actually save this as cookbook if then. And let me make a new file uh, and save this as cookbook if then else. Okay. So first off, let me write in Python, and in fact, I'll just be kind of lazy and I'll paste in this okay something that looks uh, sort of this um, so um, no Teague you're not being dumb okay the difference is this so let's look at um, this statement here under what conditions do you perform the operation 
more stuff. Okay, so we have stuff, do thing, and more stuff. Uh, does When does more stuff get executed here? Yeah, okay, but it also gets executed even if the con uh, the condition is not met. Yeah, so, okay, exactly what you said there. So when we execute these four lines, right, one of two things is going to happen, okay? Um, stuff will happen no matter what. Do thing may or may not happen, but then more stuff definitely happens, okay? So the order of execution... It's either that or it's that, okay? The first one, if the condition is true. The second one, if the condition is false, okay? All right, now let's contrast that with an if-then-else statement. Well, let me say, let me say it this way. If the condition is true, then it will be stuff, do thing, and more stuff, just like before. But if it's not true, it will be stuff, do other thing, more stuff. Okay, so does the distinction make sense between... Uh, those two um, those two constructs. So he, in the previous example, do thing only gets executed uh, if if the condition is true. Uh, and it does not get executed, so nothing happens in between stuff and more stuff if the condition is false. In an if-then-else kind of construct, something happens in between stuff and more stuff. The question is just which of the two things it is. Is it do thing or do other thing? Okay, so that's the difference between if-then and if-then-else, is whether or not there is definitely something that happens in the middle or just possibly something that happens in the middle. Okay. Um, okay, so Teague, that, that makes sense. Tyler, you're good. Uh, how, how are my rest of my crew here? Um, it's like we got Jimmy, Nick, uh, um, Reese, Mr. McKinney, Sam, and a few other people. I don't know who their nicknames are. Uh, that distinction is uh, is hopefully okay. We Gucci, we Prada. Sorry, I'm looking over to the laptop so I can see the chat window. Okay, so let's sort of translate this, okay? So we would have the assembly for stuff, and at the end, we're going to have the assembly for more stuff, of course, whatever those two things are. Okay, now, we need to, like before, we need to compute whatever the condition is, okay, whatever the, the value of that logical statement is, and store it someplace. Okay, and now computing the condition, right, this, this uh, line of English may correspond to like five lines of assembly. It depends on what the condition is, 
okay? So if your condition is relatively simple, it might only take a couple of lines. If it's really complicated, it might take like a gajillion lines. That depends on the condition. Okay, so um, store whatever you're going to call false into R0. Then I'm going to do a jump and I'm going to have Rx mn. Okay, then here I'm going to have uh, the instructions. Uh, I'll have a second jump, and I'll explain that one in a second. Okay. So, um, Okay, so if I'm going to jump, that means I'm going to not do do thing, but I need to then do other thing. Okay, so I would need to have two jump commands. Okay, so the first one is going to be what takes me from doing do thing to doing other thing, okay? And um, so that would mean that I would have a, uh, this jump will jump me to this line here, okay? So if the statement is false, that means I need to do the else condition. So I need to jump to the part of the code where the else procedure is written, okay? If the statement is true, um, you know what? I've written this backwards, guys. I am really sorry. Um, all right, let me fix it. Uh, hang on one second. Um, I've written this backwards there. Okay, now I've got it right. So, all right, the the jump here would, if the jump is true, or the jump takes place if I have false in register zero and false in the register I'm comparing to zero. Okay, so that means that I, uh, the condition is in fact false. Okay, and, um, Wait, hold on. I think I may have second guessed myself. No, I had it right the first time. Oops. Okay. So, so let me back up. Um, when I execute this jump command, what's going to happen is it's going to compare the register that I pick with the register zero. Okay, those things are either equal or they're not. Okay, if they are equal, then that means the condition was in fact false. And I should jump to this part of the program where I have my, the else case, the false case. Okay, um, if the condition is true, then this jump will not take place, and I'll just move on to this line here. I'll do the thing, and then I need to make sure that I don't then do the other thing, so this second jump will take me down to the more stuff line. Okay, now let's talk specifically about that particular jump command, the one I've got highlighted. Um, under what conditions does jump zero comma memory address get executed. Okay, so jump zero comma something. When does that get executed? All of the time, okay? Always gets executed if you get to that line. Now, let's be clear. Why 
does it always get executed? Mm. <laughs> no, <laughs> neither neither of those are uh, are true. Yeah, that's the real reason, Teague. It's because you're comparing register zero to itself. Well, no matter what's in register zero, it's equal to itself, right? So this is an unconditional jump. Okay, because register zero is always equal to itself. Um, okay, so uh, if we go back over here to the nodes, let's look at the conditional here. It, um, this program there. Okay. Um, now, in this particular case, you'll notice that I didn't actually have a second jump. Um, and the reason that I was able to get away with it in this program is because I had two halt commands. Okay. Um, I put a halt command in each case. And that's why I was able to get away without doing this without. Uh, two separate jumps. So maybe actually what I need to do here is to rewrite this example program uh, but using sort of this cookbook version uh, where we would have two jumps and then therefore only one halt command. Um, so I'll do that after class and maybe update the notes here and say call this like detecting negatives version 2 and you guys can see that they're even though they're structurally different, they end up giving the same the same result. So I'll uh, I'll work on that after class. Um, okay. So I know that was kind of high level and a little bit abstract here, um, but this is sort of the the thought process that you guys are going to have to go through when you write a program, um, because what we're going to do for our last project is. I'm basically going to give you guys uh, some Python, okay? And in fact, let me just show you what that Python is going to be. Um, let's see where I put it. Um, well, let's take this one, okay? So here is a program I wrote in Python to compute the GCD of two numbers, okay, and uh, this is sort of the fancy pants version. Let me load the, uh, the, the most basic version, okay. So some of this you can ignore. For example, anytime we have printing, um, there is no print command, obviously, on our Brookshire processor, so those can get, uh, those can get, um, uh, skipped um, and um, let me actually do uh, clean this up a little bit. Okay, I also put into this program a step counter just to count the number of steps. So, um, oops, that's not the right version of the program. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I meant. Um, I think I meant this one. Yeah, here we go. This is the one I meant to, to load. Okay. So um, if you guys think back, and we'll talk about some of the details of this Monday. If you guys think back to, you know, probably elementary, middle school, somewhere in there, you learned how to talk about the greatest common factor uh, or greatest common divisor of two numbers. Um, and you probably learned a procedure for figuring out what that was. A common one that people do is uh, if the numbers are small, you come up with their prime factorization and then just look at what's common to both of them. Um, but this is the algorithm, and this algorithm is ancient. Um, it's known to the ancient Greeks and probably uh, to the ancient Chinese, and right, a lot of people knew this. Uh, it works by continual subtraction. So, what you guys are basically going to do. And, and I'll outline this in, a, in a, the assignment file, is take a procedure that I've written in a high-level language, namely Python, 
and translate that into assembly for our particular processor. Uh, but in the process, uh, you'll notice that we've got sort of some of these primitive elements. You've got, oops, you've got if, el if then else's, you've got a while loop, um, you've got some subtraction and going on, you've also got conditions where you're looking at whether or not a thing is less than another thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it'll be basically to take kind of the cookbook stuff and translate it into this. And I've got sort of some scaffolding, so you'll write sort of some sub-programs and then kind of put it all together. Um, all right, so we're over time. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's, uh, it's not like anybody has athletic practice to get to. Uh, all right, so I will uh, I'll quit the stream here. And uh, then I will see you guys on Monday. Um, don't forget the, um, excuse me, final version of your um, of your um, um, scratch game is uh, due Sunday night to Canvas. Um, so make sure that you update the design document, however, is relevant, uh, and that you have a link to your program, and of course that you've actually shared uh, your program so that I can see it. Um, yeah, okay, well, I will see you guys uh, later.